Good morning, friends and family. God bless you, each and every one. Thank you for those who come to the channel and have that desire within you to study. We just pray more hunger, more hunger, more hunger over the body of Christ in Jesus' name. So we're on Revelations 4, or I'm on Revelations 4 and 5, and this is entitled, Come Let Us Adore Him. This is, Revelation is absolutely amazing, yet so much of it I don't fully understand, and I'm sure you don't either, and that's exactly why we study, amen? And the, the Lord said to read this book. It would be a blessing for us. There would be a blessing upon us. So as we read and we pray, God, just, you know, unfold this so we can understand and I just see like a, a rose, you know, Lord, begin to unfold this so we get down to the bud of what this means in the beauty of Revelation. So this is um, entitled, Come Let Us Adore Him. The true spiritual worship here is, is perhaps it's one of the greatest needs in our individual lives, in our individual churches. It is. It is one of the greatest needs. We need more of it. The praise, you know, God says he inhabits our praises. Well, we want to be, each and every one of us are wanting to go deeper. Each and every one of us are wanting to be inhabited by God. Amen. So, I know that's right. There, There is today, there's a constant emphasis today on witnessing for Christ and working for him, but, but not enough is said about worshiping him. So today, we just, I just, today, as we go to Revelations 4, 11, Revelations 5, 12, to worship means to ascribe worth. So we definitely want to be ascribing worth to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords each and every day. So it means to use all that we are and all that we have to praise God for all that he is and all that he does. Let us keep that in mind every single day. Heaven is a place of worship and God's people shall worship him throughout eternity. You know, maybe it would be good for us to, to get into practice now. <laughs> get into practice now. For when we're in heaven. Uh, this study of Revelations 4 through chapter 5 is going to certainly help us better understand how to worship God and give him the glory that he deserves. If, if Revelations 119 actually is God's inspired outline of this book, then Revelations 4 ushers us into the third division quote, the things which shall be hereafter, end quote. So, in fact, that is exactly what God said to John when he summoned to him to heaven. It would appear that in this experience, John illustrates what will happen to God's people when the church age is has run its course. <clears throat> Excuse me. Heaven will happen. There will be a voice. And the sound of a trumpet. And, and the saints will be caught up to heaven. That's all going to happen. It's not a story. It's not a fairy tale. I, I've probably said that a couple times lately. But I just get that impression from people that I talk to sometimes. That it's like, yeah, it, it, someday, somewhere, somehow, maybe. You know, like people are really have been, it, it's been taught to them. Maybe, maybe even as children. But they're not fully believing. But let me tell you. There's coming that day. There is coming that day that heaven will open. There will be a voice and there will be a sound of that trumpet and the saints will be caught up to heaven. See 1 Corinthians 15 verses 52, verse 52. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Then God's judgment on the earth can begin. But before God pours out his wrath, he gives us a glimpse into glory and he permits us to hear the worshiping creatures in heaven as they praise. And there are two aspects of their worship are presented 
for our instruction and for our imitation. They worship the creator. And the key word in this chapter is throne. It is used 14 times. In fact, it this is a key word in the entire book appearing 46 times. So no, no matter what may happen on earth, God is on his throne and is in complete control. Various teachers interpret revelation in, direct, in different ways, but all agree that John is emphasizing the glory and the sovereignty of God. What an encouragement that would be to the suffering saints, say, of John's day and of every age in history, using the throne <coughs> as the focal point. We can easily understand the arrangement of this exciting chapter. Let me get a drink of my water here. Okay. So, on the throne, in verses 2 and 3, this is God the Father, Almighty God. God the Father, since the Son approaches the throne in Revelations 5, verse 6, and the Spirit. Spirit is pictured before the throne in Revelations 4, verse 5. There is no possible way for human words to describe what God is like in his essence. John can only use comparisons. Jasper is a clear gem. See Revelations 21, 11. And the, the sardine is red. The Lord is, is robed in light according to Psalms 104.2 and 1 Timothy 6.16. And then both the jasper and the sardis, or sardine, sardine, it looks like, in parentheses, they were found in the breastplate of the high priest. See Exodus 28. And then around the throne, a rainbow, verse 3. The rainbow was a complete circle, not merely an arc. For in heaven all things are completed, right? So the, the rainbow reminds us of God's covenant with Noah in Genesis eleven seventeen, symbolic of his promise that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. And then God's covenant, as we shall see, it was not only with Noah, but with all his creation. Judgment is about to fall. But the rainbow reminds us that God is merciful. Even when he judges, he's merciful. See Habakkuk 3, verse 2. Usually a rainbow appears after the storm, but here we see it before the storm. And then in verses 3, let's see, 4, 6, and 7, the rainbow was around the throne vertically. Note this, vertically, while these heavenly beings were around the throne horizontally. So as it were in the king's court, who were these 24 elders seated on thrones? Has anybody, have y'all studied that out? It's unlikely that they're angels because angels are not numbered. See Hebrews 12, 22. Crowned or enthroned. They're not numbered, they're not crowned, and they're not enthroned. And then in Revelation 7, 11, the elders are distinguished from the angels. And see also Revelations 5, verses 8 through 11. The crowns they were are the victor's crowns. The, the Greek word, Stephanos, see Revelations 2.10. The victor's crowns. And we have no evidence that angels receive rewards. These elders probably sim symbolize the people of God in heaven, enthroned and rewarded. There were 24 courses of priests in the Old Testament temple. As we look at 1 Chronicles 24, 3 through 5 and verse 18. And see also Luke chapter 1, verse 5 through 9. God's people are kings and priests, Revelations 1, 6. Reigning and serving with Christ. And note, especially their, their praise, Revelations 5, 9 through 10. When, when Daniel 
So the thrones set up, they were empty. But when John saw them, they had been filled. So since there were 12 tribes of Israel and 12 apostles, possibly, just possibly, the number 24 symbolizes the completion of God's people. Search it out. Don't take my word for anything. Do your own research. And I'm trying to give scripture reference in order to help you do that. The white robes and palm branches speak of victory in Revelation 7, verse 9. And these are the overcomers who have conquered because of their faith in Christ, 1 John 5, 4, and also verse 5. Also around the throne, John saw four living creatures, or beasts, it says in the King James Version, who were nearer to God than the angels and the elders. And they resemble the cherubim that the prophet Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 1, 4 through 14, and then 10, 20 through 22. But their praise in Revelations 4, 8 reminds us of the seraphim of Isaiah 6. So I believe that these special creatures symbolize God's creation and are related to God's covenant with Noah in Genesis 9, verses 8 through 17. The faces of the living creatures parallel God's statement in Genesis 9.10. His covenant is with Noah, the face of the man, the fowl, the face of the eagle, the cattle, the face of the calf, and the beast of the earth, the face of the lion. These creatures signify the wisdom of God, full of eyes. And proclaim the holiness of God. They are heavenly reminders that God has a covenant with his creation. That he rules his creation from his throne. So the presence of the emerald rainbow further enhances this image. Since the rainbow was given as the sign of the creation covenant. But no matter what terrible judgment might fall on God's earth, he will be faithful to keep his word. You know, men may curse him during the judgments. See Revelation 16, verse 9, verse 11, verse 21. But nature will praise him. Nature will magnify his holiness. The cherubim described in Ezekiel 1 seem to have a part in the providential workings of God in the world pictured here by the, quote, wheels within the wheels. God uses the, the forces of nature to accomplish his will, Psalms 148. And all nature praises and thanks God. Some students see in the four faces described in Revelations 4-7 an illustration of the fourfold picture of Christ given in the gospel accounts. Matthew is the royal gospel of the king illustrated by the, the lion. Mark emphasizes the servant aspect of the Lord's ministry, the calf. And Luke presents Christ as the compassionate son of man. John magnifies the deity of Christ, the son of God, the eagle. So finally, you know, the name used by these creatures, Lord God Almighty, emphasizes the power of God. As mentioned in chapter 1, the name Almighty is used nine times in Revelation. And the only other such usage in the New Testament is 2 Corinthians 6, verse 18. But it's found at least 31 times in Job. A book that magnifies the power of God in nature. So, out of the throne, verse 5a storm signals and, and the bible says and from the throne produced flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder see the nasb version there are indications of a coming storm and reminders of god's awesome power these storm signals quote end quote storm signals will be repeated during the time of judgment always proceeding from the throne and the temple of God. See Revelations 8, Revelations 11, 
verse 19. Revel Let me go back. Revelations 8, 5 for those who are studying. Revelations 11, 19. Revelations 16, 18. God has indeed prepared his throne for judgment. Psalms 9, verse 7. Note 77, 18 also. Our world does not like to think of God as a God of judgment. Let me say that again because it's so true. Our world does not like to think of God as a God of judgment. They prefer, prefer to look at the rainbow around the throne and ignore the lightning and ignore the thunder out of the throne. And, and he certainly is a God of grace, but his grace reigns through righteousness. We have to know that. Romans 5.21 This was made clear at the cross where God manifested both his love for sinners and he manifested his wrath against sin. In verses 5 through 6, the seven lamps can represent completeness and symbolize the Holy Spirit of God. Revelations 1 4, note also Ezekiel 1 13. John also seems to suggest in Revelation that the heavenly sanctuary follows the pattern of the earthly tabernacle and temple. See Hebrews 9 verse 23. And the parallels are as follows There is no temple in heaven in a material sense, all of heaven is God's sanctuary for those who serve before his holy throne. Revelation 7.15 However, John indicates in Revelations 15 that there is a special sanctuary of God. Note also Revelations 11 verse 19 In the eternal state there will be no temple. Revelations 21.22 A pure crystal sea symbolizes God's holiness. And the mingled fire speaks of his holy judgment. The crystal firmament in Ezekiel's vision also comes to mind in Ezekiel 1.22. It was the foundation for God's throne. And then we shall meet this, quote, sea of glass again in Revelation chapter 15, where it is connected with Israel's victory over Egypt. In verses 9 through 11, whenever the living creatures, creatures glorified God, the elders would fall before the throne and they would praise him. The book of Revelation is filled with hymns of praise. And I don't know whether to give you all those scriptures or not, but it, it would be good for us to look them up. So let me go ahead and give them. Revelations 4, 8 and 4 11 5 9 through 13 7 12 through 17 11 15 through 18 chapter 12 10 through 12 chapter 15 3 through 4 chapter 16 5 through 7 18 2 through 8 19 2 through 6 and you very well might want to look that up. The, the emphasis on praise is significant when you remember that John wrote this book to encourage people who are going through suffering and persecution. To what? To praise, to give praise, to give thanks no matter what. The, the theme of his, his hymn is God the Creator. While in Revelations 5, the elders praise God the Redeemer. The praise in Revelation 4 is given to the Father on the throne, while in Revelation 5 it is directed to the Son, the Lamb, before the throne. And then the closing hymn, 513, is expressed to both. Um, this is another proof, actually, of the deity of Jesus Christ. If the 24 elders typify the people of God in heaven, then we must ask, why should God's people praise God the Creator? If the heavens are declaring the glory of God, why shouldn't God's heavenly people join the chorus? Creation bears constant witness to the power, to the wisdom, to the glory of God. See Psalms 19. 
Acknowledging the Creator is the first step toward trusting the Redeemer. All things were created by Him and for Him, and by, by Him all things consist or hold together. See Colossians 1, 16 through 17. But sinful man worship, worships and serves the creature. Cre Let me start again. <clears throat> but sinful man worships and serves the creature more than the creator. And this is idolatry. See Romans 1 verse 25. Sinful man has polluted and destroyed God's wonderful creation and is going to pay for it. See Revelations 11 verse 18. Creation is for God's praise and pleasure, and man has no right to use, usurp that which rightfully belongs to God. Man plunged creation into sin so that God's good creation is today a groaning creation. Let me get another sip of water and then I'll give you those scriptures. <coughs> Excuse me, friends. I've still been having a little bit of trouble with my throat. All right, let me go over that. A man plunged creation into sin so that God's good creation, Genesis 1.31, is today a groaning creation, Romans 8.22. Such a beautiful scripture. All creation groans. All creation praises the Holy One of Israel. But because of Christ's work on the cross, it will one day be delivered, and become a glorious creation. See Revelations 8, 18 through 24. It's unfortunate that the church today often neglects to worship the God of creation. You know, um, somebody was mentioning to me in church last night. I was in a service, and she was saying, it, it's so awesome because this church, when you walk in, they don't have a bulletin they give you of exactly, you know, they're going to sing three songs and then they're gonna, the preacher's going to preach and they're going to have the, uh, the offering, tithes and offerings, and then da-da-da-da-da-da-da, right down the line. They tell you what they're going to do. But this church happened to move by the power of the Holy Spirit as God led the people of God there. And it is beautiful when uh, the churches do that we're going to have as it said it will one day be delivered and become a glorious creation revelations 8 18 through 24. it's unfortunate that the church today does neglect worship and and the god of creation the real answer to the problem is not it's not financial and it's not legal but it's a spiritual problem it's a spiritual problem within the world and within the people, within the church. It, it's only when man acknowledges the creator and begins to use creation to God's glory that the problems will be solved. The focus of attention now shifts in uh, 5 to chapter 5. It shifts to the seven-sealed scroll in the hand of God. So the, let's go there. The scroll could not be read because it was rolled up and it was sealed, kind of like a Roman will with seven seals. So John could see writing on both sides of the scroll, scroll, which meant that nothing more could be added. What was written was completed and it was final. The scroll represents Christ's title deed, to all that the Father promised him because of his sacrifice on the cross. The Bible says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen nations for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Psalms 2, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. Hebrews 1 and verse 2. 
He's our beloved kinsman redeemer who was willing to give his life to set us free from bondage and to restore our lost inheritance. And you can find that, see that in Leviticus 25 through 23 through 46 and the book of Ruth. You can also see it in Jeremiah 32 verses 6 through 15. As Christ removed the seals, various dramatic events took place. The, the seventh seal introduced the seven trumpet judgments. See Revelations 8 verses 1 through 2. And then when the seventh trumpet had blown, the great day of God's wrath was announced. Ushering in the vile bowl judgments that brought to the to the climax the wrath of God in Revelations 11 15 15 through 1 it's possible that the trumpet judgments were written on one side of the scroll and the bowl judgments on the other you know um, a title deed or will can be opened only by the appro appointed appropriate and appointed heir and this is Jesus Christ. No one in all the universe can be found worthy to break the seals. It was, it's no wonder that John wept, for he realized that God's glorious redemption plan for mankind can never be completed until the scroll was opened. The Redeemer had to be near of kin, willing to redeem and able to redeem. And Jesus Christ meets all of the qualifications. He became flesh, so he is our kinsman. He loves us and is willing to redeem. And he paid the price, so he is able to redeem. Now we are able to enter into the worship experience described in the remainder of Revelations chapter 5. And we'll just discover four compelling reasons why we worship Jesus Christ. In verses 5 through 7, because of who he is, uh, three unique titles are given to our Lord to describe who he is. First, he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The reference here is to Genesis 49, 8 through 10, where Jacob prophetically gave the scepter to Judah and made it the uh, tribe of the kings. Jesus Christ is the only living Jew who can prove his king kingship from the genealogical records. Son of David was a title often used when he was ministering on earth. See Matthew 1. But he is also the root of David, which means he brought David and David's line into existence. As far as his humanity is concerned, Jesus had his roots in David. Isaiah 11 verses 1 and verse 10. But as far as his deity is concerned, Jesus is the root of David. And this speaks, of course, of our Lord's eternality. He is indeed the Ancient of Days. How the Messiah could both be David's Lord and David's son was a problem. Jesus presented to the Pharisees, and they could not or would not answer him. See Matthew 22, 41 through 46. And when John turned to see, he saw not a lion, but he saw the lamb. Jesus Christ is called the lamb at least 28 times in the book of Revelation. And the emphasis is not to miss 28 times in the book of Revelation. Look it up. God's wrath is the wrath of the lamb. Revelation 6:16. Cleansing is by the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 7, 14. The church is the bride of the Lamb, Revelations 19, 7 and 21, verse 9. The theme of the Lamb is an important one throughout Scripture, for it represents the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. The Old Testament question, where is the Lamb? Genesis 22 7 was answered by John the Baptist who cried behold behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world in John 1 verse 29 the choirs of heaven sing worthy is the Lamb Revelations 5 12 
The description of the lamb, Revelations 5, 6. If produced literally by an artist would provide a grotesque picture, but when understood symbolically, conveys spiritual truth. Since seven is the number of perfection, we have here perfect power. Seven horns, perfect wisdom would be seven eyes, perfect presence, seven spirits in all the earth. These qualities, omnipotent, omniscience, and omnipresent, and, and all these are the attributes of God. The Lamb is God the Son, Jesus Christ. We worship Jesus Christ because of who he is. That song comes to my mind, because of who he is. We worship him. I wish I could sing, and I would actually sing that song for you. It came to me so strong. Because of who he is. But then there is a second reason why we worship him. Because of where he is. Verse 6. So to begin with, Jesus is in heaven. He is not in the manger. He, he is not in Jerusalem. He is not on the cross. He's not in the tomb. He is ascended. He is exalted in heaven. What an encouragement this is to suffering Christians. To know that their Savior was defeated, excuse me, that their Savior has defeated every enemy and is now controlling events from glory. So Jesus, he too suffered, but God turned his suffering into glory. But where is Christ in heaven? The Bible says he is in the midst. The Lamb is the center of all that transpires in heaven. All creation centers in him, as do all of God's people. The angels around the throne encircle the Savior and praise him. He is also at the throne. Some sentimental Christian poetry and, and some of those who write hymns have, have basically dethroned our Savior and emphasize only his earthly life. These poems and songs glamorize the gentle carpenter or the humble teacher. But you know what? They fail to exalt the risen Lord. <clears throat> they fail to exalt him. We don't worship a babe in a manger or a corpse on a cross. We worship the living, reigning Lamb of God who is in the midst of all in heaven. Because in verses 8 and 10, because of what he does, when the lamb came and he took the scroll, see Daniel 7, 13 through 14, the weeping ended and the praising began. God's people, the representatives of God's creation, joined their voices in a new song of praise. And note, that praise and that prayer were united. They were united for incense is a picture of prayer rising to the throne of God. Psalms 141 verse 2, Luke 1 verse 10. We shall meet the incense prayers of the saints again. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. Revelations 8, 1 through 6. What a kind of song did they sing. To begin with, it was a worship hymn, for they said, Thou art worthy. To worship means to ascribe worth, and Jesus alone is worthy. Revelations 5, verse 6, Thou was slain and hast redeemed us. And, and some texts read them a little bit differently. But let me read this the way, the way that I have it here. Thou was slain and hast redeemed us by the blood. The word translated slain means violently slain, Revelations 5, 6. Heaven sings about the cross and the blood. In Genesis 22, a ram was a substitute for Isaac, a picture of Christ giving his life for the individual. See Galatians 2, 20. And then at Passover, the lamb was slain. For each family. Exodus 12 verse 3. Isaiah states that Jesus died for the nation of Israel. Isaiah 53 verse 8. And see also John 11. John affirms that the lamb died for the whole world. John 1 29. 
You know, the more that you meditate on the power and the scope of Christ Jesus' work on the cross, the more humbled and worshipful you become. This song was also a missionary song. Sinners were redeemed, the Bible says, verse Revelations 5, 9, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Kindred refers to a common ancestor and tongue to a common language. People means a common race and a nation, a common rule or government. God loves the whole world, John 3, 16. And his desire is that the message of redemption be taken to the whole world, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And that's our job. That's up to us. The man who wins souls is wise. Amen. We've got to take the word of God out to into the world. Take it out into the highways and the byways. I think I said that in the last chapter. I apologize if I, I say things over again. It's not that I forget. It's that the word is so powerful. And there's such a call on the hearts. On my heart anyway. And I'm sure on many of yours to get the word out. Okay, so like Melchizedek of old, believers are kings and priests, Genesis 14, 7. That's who we are, friends. That's who we are. We're kings and priests of the Most High. Hebrews 7, verse, Hebrews, all of Hebrews 7, and then 1 Peter 2, verses 5 through 10. So the veil of the temple was torn when Jesus died, and the way is opened to God. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, we reign in life as we yield to Christ and we allow his spirit to work in us. Romans 5, 17. Finally, this song was a prophetic hymn. We shall reign on the earth. Revelations 5, verse 10. And when Jesus Christ returns to earth, he will establish his righteous kingdom for 1,000 years and we shall reign with him. Revelations 20, verses 1 through 6. The prayers of the saints, thy kingdom come, will then be fulfilled. Creation shall then be set free from bondage to sin. Isaiah 11, verse 1 through 10. Romans 8, verse 17 through 23. And Christ shall reign in justice and power. And then in... Verses 11 through 14, in this closing burst of praise, all the angels and every creature in the universe join together to worship the Redeemer. What a cascade of harmony John heard. Can you imagine? In this hymn, they, they stated those things that Jesus Christ deserved to receive because of his sacrificial death on the cross. When he was on earth, people did not ascribe these things to him. For many of those things, they de he deliberately laid aside in his humiliation. He was born in weakness, and he died in weakness. But he is the recipient of all power. He became the poorest of the poor. 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 8, verse 9. And yet he owns all the riches of heaven and earth. Men laughed at him and called him a fool, yet he is the very wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.24, Colossians 2.3. He shared in the sinless weakness of humanity as he hungered, as he thirsted, and became weary. Today in glory he possesses all strength. On earth he experienced humiliation and shame as sinners ridiculed and reviled him. They laughed at his kingship and, and they attired him in a mock robe, a crown, and scepter. But all of that is changed now. He has received all honor. He has received all glory and blessing. He became a curse for us on the cross. Galatians 3 verse 13, so that we can never be under the curse of the broken law. You know, so many times when I'm going over these chapters, I just feel such a burning in my stomach and a weeping in my heart. At times it's hard for me not to break down and cry. And I know that's the presence of God. 
and he's still wanting us to enter in to his glory to finally you know lay everything aside and all all uh, everything all idolatry everything you're idolizing and go to the king of kings and adore him get in his presence and let him pour out upon you So anyway, in saying that, I just want to say, you know, if at times my voice sounds like it's breaking, that's why. The word is so beautiful and it's so powerful. Some translations read praise instead of blessing, but the Greek word carries both meanings. He is worthy of all praise. The worship service closed with the entire universe praising the Lamb of God and the Father seated on the throne. And there was even a loud amen from the four living creatures in heaven. We are permitted to say amen. Keep in mind that all this praise centered on the Lord Jesus, the Redeemer. It is not Christ the teacher, but Christ the Savior, who is the theme of their worship. Well, an uncovered person could praise the Creator. He certainly could not sincerely praise the Redeemer. All of heaven's praise came because the Lamb took the scroll from the Father's hand. God's great eternal plan would now be fulfilled and creation would be set free from the bondage of sin and death. One day the Lamb will break the seals and put in motion events that will eventually lead to his coming to the earth and the establishment of his kingdom in the earth. So in closing, as you share in these heavenly worship services, do you find your heart saying amen to that, to what they have sung already? You know, you may believe in Christ, is that he is the creator. You might believe it in Christ as the creator, but have you, you, yourself, trusted him as your redeemer? If not, I want to tell you today, will you do so right now? I want to ask you that. Because Jesus is still standing at the door, and he's saying, let me just read you the scripture, and I pray that your hearts will be opened. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20 And I am going to close. This is chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation I want you to think about that scripture in Revelations 3.20. Jesus is standing at the door. He's standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking. Can't you see that picture in your mind? And he said, of any man, any man, not just you, you or you, but any man, hear my voice. And I want to tell you today, if you're hearing his voice, his, his direction to you is to open the door of your heart. And he said, I will come in to you and I will sup with you. And he and you will sup with him. And I know that that's. I, I, if I could, I just would like to make that picture so much clearer to you, but. I don't have the words even to make it clear. But I do want to tell you this. When you go to him, when you open your heart to him, when you invite him to come in, when you say, Lord, I do want to sit down at the table with you, or I do want to sup with you, 
I do want you to come in. There is a revelation that will come to you. There is a holiness of his presence. And there is a revelation that will come to you like you have never, ever experienced all the days of your life. So I want to encourage you to remember that verse and go back and read it. Because he's standing at the door and he's saying, come on, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear me, open the door and I will come in. And I will sup with you. Amen. God bless you each and every one. Our prayers go out over the people that come to this video that come to the podcast and our prayer is that God will draw you closer to him, that God will bring you in so close to him, that you will walk so close to him, there will never be anything that could deceive you, that you will walk so close to him, that covering of his presence around you will be your comfort night and day, your peace, your joy. It will be your everything. That is our prayer for you today in Jesus' precious name. Amen.